Hello, and welcome back to Conscious Caregiving with L&L, where we're tackling the tough conversations. The topic this month is staffing issues, resolutions, and seniors. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Conscious Caregiving with Alan L. I am one of the co-hosts, Lance Slatton. I'm also the host of All Home Care Matters and the co-host of the Caregiver's Journal with Denise Brown, along with my esteemed other co-host, Ms. Lori LeBay, the founder of Alzheimer Speaks and the co-founder of Dementia Map. We thank you all for taking time to be with us today to discuss this important topic. I want to introduce you to our audience, and I want to first start with uh, Joel Prevo. If you could take a moment and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, happy to be here. I'm a longtime senior housing and long-term care operator as uh, covering the full continuum of care. I now provide consulting services and I find uh, all my passion in the space where technology and innovation intersects with healthcare and long-term care. And so I'm excited about today's conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here, Joel. Uh, next, we'll go to Deb Nagard. Yep, it's Nygaard, Nygaard. Uh, good, good Norwegian name, although they don't pronounce it that way. Uh, I am the Assisted Living Director and Director of Development at a small residential care provider called Arthur's Senior Care. I have been with the company for 35 years, and uh, I'm responsible for admissions and outreach and things like that in addition. Um, I do all the dementia training for our new employees, so I've got a bunch of certification that's boring. But I've also lo lost six family members to various forms of dementia, so it is a personal topic for me as well. Thank you for being here, Deb. Next, we'll go to Ron Bowen. Hi, my name is Ron Bowen. I am currently the executive director at the Pines at Hilton Head. Yes, palm trees. Um, love it. And I have a past history since being in healthcare for dementia. My Both my parents, my dad already passed with vascular dementia, and my mother currently has dementia as well. So I've dealt with many, many family members. Training is very important to me, being on the ground level throughout my career. So happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I want to start with Joel and uh, talk about a lot of the issues that, you know, we're facing in healthcare and some of the challenges that we're all facing and having a home care company. We see challenges all the time, not so much with existing staff, but it's about recruiting and finding new staff. And I'm very fond of saying, though, we're not special. It's not just home care or health care. We're seeing these challenges, I think, in all of our communities where restaurants are, you know, doing away with the dinner hours or banks are closing their lobbies because they can't staff it and any number of issues. So, Joel, I want to talk about what some of the initiatives are that are having an impact on staffing issues in these communities. What are you seeing? So I'm seeing a lot of things uh, being embraced in the field. And as you said, at the community of, at large, uh, in terms of just innovative ways to do what we already need to do, everyone's been asked to do more with less for a long time. Uh, COVID poured fuel on that fire, and uh, we've seen a lot of sudden transitions. So the adoption of technology and innovation has gone up. I see a higher, a, a greater appetite for these solutions whenever I'm at conferences or speaking with operators. Um, so things like the we see cleaning and, and dietary robots, for example, or uh, a much more rapid uh, adoption of scheduling software because so many people have dealt with the, the archaic ways of just managing scheduling and realized these solutions really are um, very viable and really helpful in terms of just cutting down time and efficient communication. And, and I'm kind of working, you know, from the more cutting edge things of diet of, uh, you know, robotics to scheduling software, which has been around a long time, but those systems are, are better and getting more integrated. And then all the way back to technology that's been around for a really long time, like just the vital science machines. When I started in the industry over 20 years ago, the care center I managed, we had the, you know, the nurse Rosies and the, the vital signs machines up and down the hall. And I've been doing some work with Leading Age Minnesota, and I was surprised to hear how many operators still aren't leveraging that technology that's very mature, very capable of taking time back for caregivers in terms of just collecting vital signs machines and accurately getting in, in the medical record. So we've created some tools to help them uh, with what's out there. And then you move back up to scheduling software. We found that you know, maybe about half the industry would say, we've implemented scheduling software like 
on shift or schedule pop. There's a, there's a bunch out there that have made uh, a huge difference in time savings and just um, more efficient practices. And about half of them said, we know we need to do this. We don't know where to start or we don't know which one makes sense. And so, you know, trying to help uh, operators know where there's compatibility concerns, where things work well and, and make good decisions about what they bring in. And then you move forward to a little more cutting edge with the robotics. That's an example of one we're seeing more even in the community, right? There's there's more restaurants uh, out there that are utilizing um, tray service robotics, and it works in senior settings as well in some cases, uh, as well as the cleaning robots. I have Roombas all over my house, uh, but there are commercial grade robots for cleaning in these spaces that can be done uh, safely. You know that they're. I think as an operator, the first thing you always worry about is fall risk or safety concerns. Um, but these are really sophisticated machines that can can save a lot of time. The thing I always talk about with operators is we all know a new shiny object doesn't fix it. You know, it's the implementation of anything, whether it's old things like vital signs that have been around forever, you still need to have a plan of how you roll that out. Moving through all these types of solutions it's really having a, an effective implementation and change management plan to make sure it sticks and it really does save the time and energy that you're hoping it will. What um, what are you seeing as far as the clinical side? So, you know, maintenance, housekeeping, dietary. Do you have any examples of services or technology that could maybe have the, have the potential to have a great impact in those areas, but they're not necessarily being utilized? Yeah, I think there are a couple of key things that are being getting a lot of buzz lately, right? So AI is the big animal that we all hear about out there. Uh, and and chat GPT is really what kind of, you know, open AI and generative AI is what really got the extra buzz out in, in the uh, broader community. We hear about it all the time. The thing is, AI has been around a long time and is embedded in a lot of our solutions already. So this is just kind of a new generation of it. And I think a lot of people are wondering, how is this going to impact my work? Like, how do I actually use this? Because I can, as a consumer, can play with chat GPT. And it, it's, I encourage anyone to do it because it's astonishing what it can do. It's fast. It's getting more and more accurate all the time. But when you move into a, a workspace, you're, you know, a lot of us are saying, what is this going to do? And I work with a client who's, building solutions in this space for senior housing. And it's things like regulatory compliance, uh, rent roll, uh, uh, lots of back room types of processes that are very detailed, but also just repetitive and take a lot of human capital and time to manage can be quickly discerned by an AI machine. And that, that analysis then can save a lot of time for people then to make better decisions. So that's where I think the first solutions are going to hit the hit the market, uh, where, for example, when I say regulatory, um, I can go back to the beginning of my career when you would go through a survey with your community and you get your, your results and say, you didn't have a perfect survey, you have a list of deficiencies you need to um, fix. And before you can really get to that work, I mean, you're going to put people to work right away on, on the things you need to repair, but you also need to write that plan of correction and commit to the health department. This is the stuff we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And they approve it. And you have a short window, 10 days to get that in. Uh, AI can write that for you because it's really not creative. It's the, the, the plan of correction is a formula of we're going to fix this thing. We're going to do it immediately we're going to audit ourselves and we're going to make sure we check that we did it right it's it's really a formula under any any uh deficiency you receive so it can write that for you you can touch it up but it can do it in a matter of seconds through you know my client for example is developing these tools where i caution people is you need to find a partner for any of these solutions that is trusted because you can't go into chat GPT and I wouldn't say, write me a plan of correction for these deficiencies. I would want someone, a, a partner in the industry that understands our field and is building a tool that makes sense. Because with AI, as simple as I can say it is, it's only as good as the data and the information it, it's fed. So uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if it's a controlled 
uh, ecosystem with the right information, it can be amazing. So that's kind of, you know, and I'm no AI expert, but that's how I see it with the with the uh, exposure I've had with my client and, and just what I'm learning as I play with it. The other fun one that I really like is bidets. I think bidets are underutilized. They're not understood fully in our country as far as utilization. And I think they have a place in both the home setting as well as, uh, you know, a facility or, or uh, residential communities. They make too much sense when it comes to bringing dignity to people, independence with managing uh, their their um, you know bathroom needs, and when you talk about staff needing some some time back or you know job satisfaction, I think that's one of the hardest parts of the job. And if you can remove the number of people that need care in that bathroom, not only do you gain infection control benefits, dignity benefits, but staff satisfaction, because they're they're now going to say, I have less time that I need to do this really sensitive work uh, because these people can take care of these things themselves or more independently. Yeah. I want to talk about staff because, you know, that that's kind of the big elephant in a lot of people's rooms. And that's not so much retention. Retention plays a role, but it's just a recruitment, right? Um, we were, I was sharing with you before we started here that, you know, we, we're having trouble. Everybody's having trouble recruiting staff. Our average employee uh, career span right now on staff is six and a half years, which is phenomenal for home care. But it's because, you know, we treat them with dignity, respect, you know, we're honest with them. They are paid, you know, uh, well for their roles. And you build that trust. And, you know, once they have that trust, you know, they 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 know they're appreciated and they, they get the benefit of knowing they're in a role that, you know, is very important and that they're respected in. Where, unfortunately, I feel like people usually below the RN level don't always get that experience, which kind of sets the tone in their mentality for their, you know, job to job that they go to. They're already going in with that preconceived notion but beyond like just their pay rate or their salary, what what can have a good impact on employee recruitment, retention, and you know, do you have solutions for that? Yeah, I think uh, you hit the big ones right in terms of your workplace culture and how you're you're treating people, a respectful environment, having well trained leaders who understand that and and are running your departments or, or divisions. Uh, assuming that's a given that you've built a good culture and, and, and you're still, uh, you know, it's still very competitive, right? You know, there are good employers out there doing that as well. And so it's very competitive. Uh, I, I lean back and I may be biased, but I do lean back on technology because if you are developing the tools at work, uh, whether it be having those sophisticated tools to communicate with your employer or to get your workflows completed, uh, those things matter. And I've heard that from employees firsthand to say, oh, you know, at my other job or where I used to work, they didn't have this, or I really wish they would imp- implement this. Uh, you know, I, I and, and, and I go back to change management. You've, you've got to bite these things off and bring them in because it will matter in the long run. And change is hard, even for your your existing employees. Sometimes they're struggling with, I don't want this new thing because I know what I'm doing every day and change is challenging. But if you don't evolve, you're going to lose the ability to say, yeah, we are, we have that scheduling software that makes it easy. Every day, think about everyday life and how your employees function, just like you and me. They're using their smartphone for tons of stuff, whether it's communication or, or information. Uh, it's how they function in society, they want to come to work and and have those same tools at the ready and things to be as, think about our shopping experience. It's very immediate and easy and you can compare things. That is a a way of life for a lot of us. It's how we do things. So bringing things forward like solutions for earned wages access, that's a big thing that uh, has trended lately with operators to say, employees want access to their funds. If they're going to pick up an extra shift, knowing that they leave that shift and can access half of that pay right now is an incentive in itself to know, hey, I'll I'll stay on longer or I'll pick up that extra shift because I know I'm actually going to get the money in my account where I can fill the tank tonight. And I was a little stressed about that because I, I, I have, I have a, uh, I'm trying to manage 
a tight budget. So that that type of thing, implementing that um, can really make a difference. And that's how you remain competitive. And you also um, build a culture of innovation. And having a culture of innovation means people also know they could bring forward an idea. Right. And if they feel comfortable and safe at work to say, I think we could change this, we can improve this, and you're receptive to that, that's going to go a long way. And uh, if people walk in and they go, boy, they're still operating in a really archaic way, it's it's a real turnoff, right, for, for recruitment. And I think bringing those solutions to work so that they see this is a, a forward thinking organization, it does go a long way and it makes their life easier. And then they know that they're more savvy than ever. How about recruitment? Do you have any insights on recruitment? You know, I think being able to brag about <laughs> what you have and being able to talk about what you have and saying, come work for us, because not only are you going to have check, 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 all those nice place to work, but competitive pay, all that stuff, but you're going to be part of something special. You're going to have, uh, you're going to be able to play with robots or you're going to be able to uh, work with a VR headset when you work here because uh, we are bringing forward these cutting edge things and come be part of something exciting uh, with your residents, with your coworkers, what have you. I just think that, you know, we aren't an industry of shiny object syndrome. We have to be perfect. We really do. We got to got to minimize risk. We can't just try. It has to be a tried and true solution. But if they see, wow, they have robots, they have tech, they have all these things. It's enticing enough. They might throw that resume in, right? And say, I'm going to apply for this uh, position because I've heard they're really forward thinking and doing a lot of exciting things. So I just think being able to say it and live it, you know, walk it and talk it both that you have an innovative culture. I think most try to say that, but what happens when you show them an image of people actually operating with robotics or something that's really visual for them? That's going to go a long way because people say, I want to see what that's about. And I'll at least walk in the door and, and find out more. And then, and then you've got their attention. Yeah, absolutely. Great points, Joel. And uh, thank you for that. I want to go to Lori. Well, I'm just going to make a, one comment and we'll kind of carry this conversation on after everyone's had a chance to talk. But one of the things personally that I worry about with the technology, I think it's great. But when I was in real estate, they, they made this huge shift to high tech and low touch, and it killed them because they weren't merged together. And I really think that personal relationship is extremely important. I also think that a lot of administrators think that they have this wonderful team concept, and they don't always, you know, because people are afraid to go in and talk about the toxic person that's yeah. ripping the team apart. And to me, I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. But we can talk about all of these pieces, but I think it's exciting with the the technology that's available. Um, but again, we have to look at age of who we're trying to attract too. Because if we need some older adults in there, they might not be as thrilled with, with that and that could scare them off. And I've heard a lot of people talk about that being a, a stable component as well. In, and um, and people have been kind of leaning into that a little bit more. But um, wonderful comments. Just thank you for, for um, everything that you shared with us, Joel. Deb, I want to go to you because I, you know, you're big on education. I've known Deb for like ever. They Their company is so wonderful. Um, the way they treat their employees, education first, um, kind hearted. Um, you just kind of have this ho holistic approach um, to your whole company um, in terms of what is going to help not just your resident, but your staff and everybody work as a team. So, uh, you know, one of the questions is, you know, how do you pay for this education? And legislation can be a struggle to get, you know, to get the money approved um, to pay you to do all these things that are needed. So how do we, how do we get more people to consider you know, caregiver, caregiving as a career and and elevate that position and be able to have companies really be able to do their job in terms of making sure they've got quality staff and that they're engaged. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and 
it, you know, I can actually build on some of the things that Joel said um, because it kind of starts with wages. And, you know, Joel said, you got to have that in place and then build from there. And what we found is that, um, especially for, for Arthur's, uh, <clears throat> we have a sister company, ACR Homes, that cares for people with disabilities. And that that company is strictly funded through state and federal dollars. And so we're limited in what we can pay. Arthur's, you know, we did increase our rates a little bit so we could pay our staff more. And honestly, when the wages get above $20, then you can have a conversation. Otherwise, people don't even want to consider you. And I'll, I'll say we have a very high percentage of long, long-term employees. We're actually highlighting them in our newsletter right now, anyone who's been here more than 20 years. And there's about 50 of them. So it's great to be able to, uh, to tap into those to, like Joel says, brag about what you have, right? We have a great job. We care about our employees. We try to put them in positions that play to their strengths so that they uh, can excel in their role and their position. Uh, I'm a perfect example of that. I started as a weekend staff. I supervised one of the homes for nine years, actually lived in as a supervisor and raised my family there. And uh, and now I'm in a role that really plays to my own personal strengths. So um, that helps a lot in keeping keeping employees. The educational piece I'll say is is twofold. <laughs> we um, we do encourage our employees to have internships with us. Often that helps them with their own education if they can have an internship. And we've had some very successful internships. We've got video testimonials of all of these. They're on our blog and people can, you know, potential recruits can see, hey, if I work for Arthur's or our sister company, ACR, I can fulfill my educational requirements and, and it's a leg up. The downside to that is they, they see us as a stepping stone and, and not a permanent career. And, you know, caregiving is a tough job. Most of us, by the time we're getting in our 30s and 40s and my age, we don't want to work evenings and weekends anymore. We want nine to five, Monday through Friday. Uh, we don't want to do the lifting. Again, the people in our care are pretty advanced. Um, a lot of our seniors are people who are using wheelchairs. Their caregiver can't manage in the home anymore. They need lifting and transferring and repositioning. And that's a lot of physical work. And so people, as they get older, don't want to do that anymore. They want a less physically demanding job. So we're looking for people who have heart for the job and uh, if we're lucky, we get to keep them for many years. If we're lucky, they want to be in a supervisory or management position. Uh, and we try to create uh, that culture so that they will stay. Uh, and I, I think we've been very successful. The other piece, um, educationally, is that if we could make caregiving more of a professional career, I think people would view it less as a stepping stone and more as something that they could stay at long term. Uh, so we do need our legislators to acknowledge that that education is important, wages are important, and then we can do those other pieces that Joel said to make it a fantastic place to work. You know, I thought it was interesting when Joel had mentioned about um, giving some immediate compensation, you know, for picking up an extra. I know. I thought, oh, I hadn't heard that one. That's a, that's a cool one. That's Have really you heard fun. that before at all? Or I had not. No, I want more details. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to Joel. <laughs> because I, I do think that that's an, an immediate need. And I do like your idea of, of this being a more professional career and not just a stepping stone. I mean, my gosh, we're, we're dealing with people's lives here and, you know, we just kind of brush it over. I, I think your company has always done a really good job of promoting within and really listening. And I know when I was in healthcare, I worked for a company like that and, you know, they, they kind of let me go in my direction or create whatever they really, really listened. And, 
we had such a strong team. I mean, anybody would cover for anybody. I mean, it was just, it, it wasn't even a question that a shift wasn't going to get full because everyone knew how important everyone's jobs were. And there was this respect among staff. And I think, you know, one of the things I hear from people is there's not that camaraderie anymore. People don't mm-hmm. know one another. They they feel highly um, managed and um that they're strictly task oriented and they don't have time to even have relationships with the people that they're caring for. Mm. And and to me, that's a huge downfall. And I don't know if I hear it more just because I'm not their boss or I'm not, you know, in a company, Mm. but that is a theme that is so solid at every single level that I talk with people, this huge, massive disconnect. And I, I just hear that people are longing for that. Why do you see people leaving, um, you know, the, their careers in the field? Or, you know, we said it's really just a job, you know, on to the next <laughs> type thing. But do you see any specifics of, of why they leave? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I'm going to say we're really lucky. The model that we have being in a home Now, Arthur's are big homes that we have six bedrooms and they each have a bathroom with a roll-in shower. The whole house is wheelchair accessible and we have two staff on for six clients. So there's a lot of camaraderie there between the staff. They support one another. Working with dementia, you know, sometimes you're the bad guy, but we can play good cop, bad cop and, and be really, really successful. And And so the job itself is great. I think that we see staff leave when they graduate, if they're a student, and they're moving on to grad school, um, or if they have another life-changing event. I would say people tend to stay if there's not the next step to, to look at you know, whether it be graduation or, or pursuing uh, the career of that they've been studying for, um, or sometimes people move, uh, which is another reason. But I, I think, <clears throat> you know, again, most of us want nine to five Monday through Friday. And so the, the older that we get, the, and the more competitors, like Joel mentioned, um, who are offering something a little bit simpler, a little less taxing physically, um, maybe that's regarded as a little bit more professional, then then it really has to be a calling for somebody to stay. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in, because I, I heard this, especially during COVID, you know, people were kind of stealing each other's employees. I'll give you 500 more bucks if you come over uh-huh. here. And, and then it's a thousand and all of a sudden it's up to ten thousand dollars you know we'll land you and then people are like what are we doing now we can't come back down you know and, and we've elevated right. prices and we don't have the budget to pay all of these pieces are, is that still going on out there um i think there's a, a lessening of that there there was definitely a, a problem for a while and they simply stay six months they get their bonus and then they look for the next a uh, hiring bonus. Uh, so I don't hear about that as often anymore. Um, but it, it's really difficult to compete with that, especially like you said, if they're not, if they don't form relationships, and it's hard to do that in six months, um, to really start to develop care and concern for the people that you support, um, and connect with your colleagues. You know, um, one of the things that I thought you guys did amazing is you really set up recruitment centers on college campuses. And I thought, how brilliant is that? But then COVID hits, you know, and no one's going to college. Right, right. Um, How, A, can you explain how that worked for you? And, you know, are you back at that? Are you able, you know, is it the same? Because it seems like, it seems like the dial has just moved and a lot of stuff that worked before doesn't work now you know, sense code. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, Lori's referring to a long-standing um, successful model that we've had of recruiting at colleges. When you look at a cross-section of the culture, 
and and you look at who's willing to work evenings and weekends and overnight awake shifts, um, who do you get? Do you, do you get the people who are unemployable from nine to five? Do you get um, maybe couples that are trying to work opposite shifts so that they can share childcare and not have to put their kids in daycare? Uh, or, or who are they? And we find um, that colleges are full of people who are bright and intelligent and motivated. They're going somewhere and um, they want to work around their school schedules. And so we've had really, really good success over the years. And um, some of those, a percentage of those people do see, wow, this, this role or staying with this company is beneficial. Um, it helps me fulfill my own personal mission or, uh, this this caregiving role or moving into an administrative role is important to me. And so we do keep a lot of them in an administrative role. Uh, you're right. During COVID, things kind of fell apart. So we were no longer able to get on campus for recruiting. And so there was immediate ramifications for that. You know, when you have, um, at the time, we think we had about a thousand employees and there's always turnover, of course. So not being able to get on campus uh, hurt us immediately. And then at, at each of our homes, we have live-in supervisors. And so the live-ins ended up covering a lot of shifts all of a sudden. And that was exhausting for them. And so then we started to burn out our supervisors. And it was very difficult to, to recover from that. We were spending a lot of money uh, and some of the the loans that we were able to access during COVID ended up being an incentives to get people, our current staff to work more. Uh, it took a while before we figured out Zoom. Lori knew it well before that. Um, but <laughs> anyway, I and so the Zoom recruiting events were, you know, just not nearly as powerful. So being back on campus again, I have to say we've made a full recovery and things are looking good. Uh, but we had a, a very, very rough spell at Arthur's. We ended up cutting our census in half. So we had three clients and one staff. And we would not recommend that because that staff had no support network. And so being alone all day, every day, it just... Um, there's no camaraderie. There's no one with whom you can banter or do good cop, bad cop, because that's that's an important tool in dementia care is being able to trade off if you've upset a, a client. And, you know, our second staff can come in and do the exact same thing, but they're the good one. They're the nice one, and they can do the same thing. But uh, without those tools, we were really kind of hamstringed. And so we we're very grateful when we could get back up to full capacity and, and return our staffing. So. Well, I, the other thing that I've just observed with your company too, is you do, you know, when you do recruitment, I mean, they put the tents out, they're barbecuing, they got music going. They're like, come on in, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I, I've, I've really appreciated that because you don't see too many companies doing that. Um, yeah. The other thing that I thought was really interesting that you did, especially with the college students when you had the coffee shop, is you guys extended the hours so they could study there. And yeah. I just thought, oh my gosh, they get their peeps. You know, it's those little things that make such a huge, huge difference, I think, in people's lives. And the last thing I'm going to mention is when you're talking about that good cop, bad cop, I think so often in, and, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but in the larger communities, people don't feel that team, that good cop, bad mm -hmm. cop. It's like you're assigned these people, I have these people, and everybody's kind of running around. Again, this is what I hear from people. And, and I, again, I think that team piece is so critical because I, I think it's a survival tool. I think it is um, a, a community connection enhancement tool, you know, that says I'm part of something bigger, you know, than just doing a task. And, and I think um, sometimes that gets overlooked. And I know there's companies that do that very well. 
But I think there's a lot of companies that don't do that. And again, aren't looking at the toxic maybe employee mm-hmm. that they hired that's ripping their good staff apart. And yeah. that really gets wearing. So thank you for, for all that mm-hmm. you've um, stated there. Lance, I'm going to throw it back to you. Okay. So Ron. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Ron, I want to first start talking about shifts. You know, um, I'm not sure about an assisted living where you're the executive director at, but in home care, for the most part, shifts are usually four to 12 hours and somewhere in between, depending on what the client and the family needs. What do you, what are your thoughts on the impact of 12 hour shifts versus say eight hour shifts? Well, you know, it's, this is the first community I've worked in that has 12 hour shifts. So obviously staffing staff, it ha- it's multifaceted, right? Like there's not one answer is for everything. Um, I-, I do find the 12 hour shifts are much easier for many reasons. One, especially when we work on Hilton Head and they have to drive because they typically don't live here. But one, mo- most caregivers work more than one job. So if you had an eight hour shift in five days, they still have to figure out within themselves, like, what their finances are to, to work more hours somewhere else because overtime would be. So working three days on, three days off, four days off, whatever, then picking up more time allows them to get 12 hours, you know, 36 hours done in three days compared to, you know, five days. And then they can, for, for families, for, you know, home, um, for uh, daycare and et cetera. I mean, I've traveled in most states and I was out throughout COVID. And, and what I found really is that your core group is, is pretty good, right? Like you can work with them. Most of them are just kind of your steady eddies, don't do any more, any less, whatever. But they're faithful and, you know, that's the core group. The, the challenge is in healthcare is that outside group that those those other folks that are not your core, that's what keeps going um, in and out and the grass is greener somewhere else. The other thing I have found is the mentality of people in general has changed since my first ED job in 2000 on how we look at work, how we do things. I mean, I feel like the shifts, the seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven or six to two or whatever, that came from the war when the ladies really had no choice because they were, um, you know, the men were out fighting the war and they had to do childcare as well. I think it's very difficult for companies to change their mentality, whether it's what Joel was saying with technology, adding in technology or being more flexible with shifts. I have four people, caregivers that are, are nursing, that are going to school for nursing. And how do I help that and still staff according to what we need to take care of the human beings we serve, right? And that also comes in between, which I feel like is harder than it used to be, is to walk that fine line between human being and business, right? Like that's that's a more difficult fine line to, to trot. But the 12 hour shift versus it works here. I did not invent that. That was here. And I came in and I'm thinking, hmm. And I will tell you another good reason that um, nurses are hard to find to begin with. So the nurse and I started at the same time. And in January, because again, I moved to South Carolina. And this is a relief to her that we're not getting a call at 11 o'clock that nobody showed up. So from a perspective of nurses, and they're hard to find to begin with, but on a perspective of that, teaching our staff, you know, you got to be respectful to your peers. And so I've had great luck of people calling me. Somebody called me yesterday morning and had to call out last night from a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift because their kids were sick. That's great. Thank you for the notice. I hope your kids are feeling better. Call outs are going to happen. But having that respect towards each other really, really has has worked well. I'm not sure that trying to switch it would work well, but I'm telling you from my standpoint, and I am just hit a big birthday of 39-ish, it's a relief to me 
not having to worry about the 11 to seven shift, to be honest with you. Same thing with the nurse. I know it's covered. Um, from, so from my perspective, the 12 hour shifts and, and traveling all over and trying to figure out nurses and I'm doing the schedule here for now, but the nurses and them are, are spending 80% of their time trying to do a schedule and trying to um, fill spots in, in assisted living. I know when I worked in the nursing home for 12 years, you know, we had a scheduler. In assisted living, typically they do not. So it really has been cumbersome in that aspect. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, but. It, it does. And, you know, I, I'm with you on the, you know, say for instance, the 11 to seven, you know, in home care, it's typically one-on-one -on -one care. So every single person has one employee taking care of them. And if it's 24 seven, instead of having two people per day, now you gotta have three. And you add that up over the week, you know, instead of 14 people a week, now you're gonna have, you know, 21 people. And it, it just presents a lot more challenges. And we have found, you know, for the most part, our staff, they like the 12 hour shifts because typically they'll work three 12s and then they have four days off too. So you get your whole week done and that's kind of after the uh, the hospital model as well. Uh, I want to talk about managers and, you know, preconceived notions and impressions people already have walking in. We kind of talked on that before we started recording. You know, it seems like everyone believes that managers of a company are all on the same page when it comes to their missions, values, expectations. But I think you and I both know that that's not really true. And how do you feel like that impacts staff? And how do you win over those people? like we were talking about earlier, who are coming in thinking, you know what, I got burnt at my last five places I worked at, it's not gonna be any different. So they're already coming in kind of at a disadvantage, you know, in their mentality, if you will. Uh, and they're almost already resigning before they even started because they feel like they're just gonna have that same bad negative experience. And then you have to do your part to win them over. Yeah, I, I think a manager has to have good emotional intelligence and low ego. So in order to, um, as, a, as a leader just coming into a community, it's really, you have to start at the bottom of the rung, right? And climb the ladder again, because you have a new staff member and you have to, staff have to learn trust. I think it's, I, I'm a very open person. So I think as a leader, putting the expectations out there up front with all the department heads first, saying, you know, we will not be, this is how, this is our goal as a team for the culture. How do we get there? You know, not everybody is going to be on board with that. Even some of our best caregivers may be a little bit grouchy or whatever. People have stuff in their lives. That old adage of leaving things at the door before you come in does not work well for people. So what tools can we give them when they come in, if they're struggling or their childcare or whatever, and how can we think out of the box to help them? But as a leader, you got to set those expectations. And sometimes that has to be turnover that you're all on the same page. I think the staff will say, well, I've been through six of you. So right. I'll just continue to do what I'm going to do and go forward there. But I really think that it's, it's just like any relationship. It takes a lot of work. I don't care if you've been married a year. I don't care if you've been married 30 years. I don't care about fr you know friendships, same amount of time. Relationships take constant, constant work because if I screw up, which I do, then I have to own it and I have to talk to people about that, you know? So, but I think setting a good culture, which we've worked really, 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 really hard here is to say, number one, it's all about the residents who work in their home. You right. know, that that's a given, that's whatever. And then taking the leaders in the community that are not on board and sitting down with them and discussing, hey, you know, we're all adults. If you got something to say, say it, we'll talk it through. There's always a bigger fish. I get told to do things that I don't agree with, but then I have a choice, right? So same thing with everybody else. Um, so those longevity folks that have been here a long time are sometimes harder to change, to, to roll over to the new way. But once they're on board, then they are the leaders of training. Because guess who's training the new staff? Yep. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so, you know, we need them to be on board so the new staff will want to stay because they are on the same page for, for um, and I do agree that, you know, from a technology standpoint, you know, we all are, are applying online. You don't get to really see people in face-to-face uh, -face sometimes. COVID, we had to do interviews on, on this. So I think just bringing somebody in and saying, tell me about yourself. Um, we like to hire for heart, which Deb said already. We can teach you the task. So tell me about your heart. Like, who have you cared for? Most Southern states do not require CNAs. The New England states where I come from do, right? Uh, CNAs or home health aides for assisted living. But down here in all the Southern states, they do not. So you have to find somebody, as Lori said, with that passion to want to be able to work with older adults. I hired somebody yesterday who took care of her grandmother for two years. I have 24 hour help with my mother in New Mexico. And it throws her with when, cause they have call outs too. It throws her for a loop when there's somebody she does not know. I get called all the time and have to walk her through what's happening and whatever. So definitely consistency, but that's not the real world, right? Like that's not the real world. So we got to take it a step further and say, okay, we know this is not going to always happen because somebody deserves to call out if they're sick. So even in my own experience, it, it's a struggle sometimes. Right. Absolutely. Do you think that by having specific uh, conversations during the interview process that it can have an impact on hiring the right staff and expand their understanding of what those expectations are so that they don't turn over so quickly and they, they kind of buy into, you know, your values and what your mission is? Well, the Amy, our, our nurse, and I talked about it before when we started bringing, because, you know, our occupancy is going up and et cetera. So we talked about what do we want out of these? I will take the culture part if you take the other part. And so we had this uh, lady, young lady come in and she interviewed, but she didn't, it, it just was not a good feeling. I think what we've done in healthcare since there's so many openings and so many different industries, we jump at whoever's walking through the door because they are, they are a body and, you know, we need staff, our own staff are getting burned out or whatever, but I had to turn her away because of the energy I was feeling from her does not match the culture we need. So now we have to wait for the next one to apply. So money is a part of it, but I think money is, you know, maybe 60%. People come to work to want to do a good job. It's in my heart. I think that. I think overall, you know, they, they want boundaries. They want rules. And then we do better. And I do think overall, the majority of people, because we have wonderful healthcare workers, no matter what level throughout this country, that dedicate their life to caring for older adults, especially with dementia, which is our passion as well. So, but I, I do think we should not be jumping for the, and people still do it. Right. We haven't had an applicant in, a, in four weeks. We need a staff member. We're going to just pull her in and hope for the best. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, kind of what you said, you know, a lot of companies get themselves into those situations because they are hiring a body just to hire a body. And that might be a, and sometimes it's not even a short-term solution, but it might be a short-term solution, but it's going to cost you long-term every time. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ron, for being here and for sharing those insights. I want to go back to Lori. Well, gosh, um, this has just been such a good conversation. I'm learning a lot and getting a lot of, of great ideas. I loved, Ron, when you talked about uh, the emotional intelligence, you know, of having high emotional intelligence as a, as a leader and manager and a low ego. And because I think sometimes we get this right or wrong mentality of my way or the highway. And, and I think it's been stated here a few different times in different ways that we have to allow staff to be creative to be part of the process of change and improvement. And, you know, again, I've seen a lot of that shut down. There's many companies that say they have an open door policy, but when you talk to the staff, no one's walking through it because it's, it's not safe and they are scared and they don't want to lose their job. I mean, with the economy and stuff, the way it is, 
um, I, I just find that the whole the whole process of the work environment has changed so much from when I look back when I was 20. You know, it was just it was teams. You know, it wasn't there. It was it was just very very different. And I think they we were allowed to be more creative, and we were we were pulled into the upper levels more in terms of what's really going on. People reach reach down to us, but it wasn't um, off-putting. They really wanted to hear what we had to say. And I don't think a lot of our staff feel that way these days. And um, and I think that emotional intelligence is is extremely important. One of the questions I wanted to to pose to all of you is, how do we get incentives for employees? Now, Joel had mentioned, hey, you know, they pick up an extra ship, they can get half. Um, I had interviewed some companies in the past and, and during COVID, and I thought this was really creative. I hadn't heard anybody else doing this. And one of the things they were doing was, uh, it happened to be in New York, you know, everything shut down and they didn't have transportation. So they started sending drivers out to pick up their people. And sometimes it was the maintenance guy who was now picking up staff in the morning and bringing them into work. And when they sent them home because they were exhausted and they were working long hours, they were sending a meal for their family home with them. So that was time saved that they didn't have to be in the kitchen cooking and cleaning or having to worry about getting groceries that they could just sit down and have a meal with their family. what are what are some other things that people are doing or think would be effective or is this is this just me being pie in the sky i just think people want more than just a paycheck um, i think they have a lot of variety of needs and many of them are very basic needs that they're struggling with and they're they're hiding and uh, and stuff so deb i'll go to you one of the things that we've done is we have uh an employee, um, we call it the safe fund. And, and so we can contribute to the safe fund by just setting aside a few dollars from our paycheck, it's diverted to this fund. And then somebody, you know, a single mom who doesn't have tires on her car, or who (laughs) needs repairs on it, or um, we had an employee who had a fire in her apartment. And so we're, we're able to take some of that money to support them. And it's funny that you talk about the uh, transportation because there have been numerous times where we've had a blizzard here in Minnesota that our maintenance guys have gone to pick people up. So, but I like the idea of sending a meal home with them too. Thank you (laughs) to add that one too. We might be doing it this weekend. Yeah. Well, in the, the meal thing, it's, you know, again, it's that whole budget management type thing. But again, you can typically buy that food cheaper than they can you know, and it's prepared and it's set and it just gives them more family time because I think that's one of the things that, that, you know, people struggle with. And when I think about, you know, our younger population, um, we hear over and over and we read it in all the articles is they don't want to live the lives their mom and pops did. (laughs) You know, they want more family time. They want, you know, they, they want, they want a life. They don't want their life to be run by their job. And so how do we make that happen? You know, is it, you know, movie tickets? Is it, is it a gas card? Is it, you know, what is it? And I've, I've heard um, more companies seem to be having the fund, like what you're talking about. Um, some have even, some of the larger companies actually have a, like almost a foundation where, you know, people can put part of their paycheck in, but they can also take donations in. And they're letting their families know this is an issue. And, you know, pulling in some funds that way to help offset. Um, But it would be interesting to see, you know, a grant or a study done on what would happen if we looked at things different. And if we appreciated people in different ways, does that affect who we can get and how long we can keep them? Um, Any other ideas that people have on that as far as the incentives? Um, one thing I love about this company is it's smaller, so I'm able to make those decisions on my own. Like if I need to go get a gas card, I've been getting gas cards and, you know, somebody picking up a shift or Publix for a supermarket instead of like 
a visa card or whatever, but making the decisions at the community level helps because it's under my decision. I'm ultimately responsible instead of, you know, a, a large company, you have to go through six or seven people to get something approved. And then the shift wasn't covered. Um, but I think the other part of the incentives is really not about monetary. It's more about, is your door open? I, I never have counseling sessions in my office. I feel like that's, this should be a safe zone for people to come in and just come in and say, hey, I'm upset, giving people freedom. And I think we're missing this in healthcare. We need to be able to fight professionally and move on. Like we need to be able to argue professionally and move on. And I put them in this, everybody in the same category. You can come in and let's, let's duke it out and figure it out and let's move on um, as long as we're able to let it go afterwards. So, but some of the incentives is just, you know, are little things like giving somebody a hug and saying, I'm sorry that, you know, I heard about your mom. I'm sorry that she was in a car wreck. I hope everything's okay. Send them a gift card, do something. But I think it's just a smile on your face is probably the biggest incentive, a positive attitude walking. I mean, I always say in the morning, good morning. It's a great day at the Pines. Let's start this day fresh and move forward. We're going to have issues. I get it. But let's, but I do think one of the bigger incentives we can do is just have a positive attitude, make sure the department heads have a positive attitude and let's just get things done. That's all I have. Well, and I think that's important though, because you know, what you're saying is I'm gonna have a relationship with my staff. I'm actually gonna know who they are and what's going on with their life and it's gonna to matter to me. And I'm gonna let them, I'm gonna be vulnerable enough to let them know I care right. and that they matter. And I think so often, we get in these positions where, you know, we're busy and we overlook the importance of that and what that means to people because, you know, we live in a wacky world these days and, you know, good feedback and somebody having your back isn't as pronounced as it used to be. Right. I've, people go out in public, they're not even sure, you know, they should say anything to somebody even like a hi because they don't know what they're going to get in return anymore. And so I really think that that stuff matters way more than um, what is what is really recognized and what is implemented. And I know when I do like trainings and stuff and talking about shifting care cultures, everyone thinks it has to cost a lot of money and it doesn't. It starts with a smile and eye contact. It's very simple. It, it, it you know, it's inclusion. It's. Uh, it's very, very little, little things. Um, Deb, go ahead. You had a comment? Yeah, I was going to mention another incentive that we have found is that not everybody has a car to get to work. And all of our homes are located in the suburbs. You, you know, they didn't put big sprawling ramblers right in the heart of the city. And that's what we need for wheelchair accessibility. And so we have uh, an employee transportation program, uh, ETP, we call it. Um, and we have a handful of cars in parking lots at various campuses, places where we get a lot of employees from. We're looking into other, other um, venues where we can also do the same program for people who just don't have transportation. Uh, especially if that shift ends at 10 or 11 p.m., bus lines aren't running then. So they can, um, for a slight reduction in hourly wage, they can use this program. They go online and they sign up for a car. They're sent a code and the key is in a lockbox on the car. And so they can unlock the key and take a car to their shift. The cars have hey, come and work for us all over the sides of them. Um, but uh, it's been a really great program and has allowed us to access a lot of people that we couldn't have otherwise. Okay, great. Um, Joel, you had a comment too? Yeah, I think uh, both Ron and Deb have, have really nailed the importance of, of knowing your team, right? And knowing 
what's important to them. And uh, Lori, you mentioned it too, even down to the, you're implementing all this technology, but you got to make sure it actually is the stuff that is going to work with your employee population at all levels of the spectrum of comfort with, with technology. And I think that engaging culture starts with having that feedback loop, right? Being able to create a culture that they feel safe to give you the feedback and a mechanism that makes that really, really easy. Both that open door, walk in, that kind of thing, uh, as well as there's, you know, technology solutions for that, right? Like through your scheduling systems or whatever software you might use for communication, making sure that's genuinely uh, an open space and that you react to it. You know, it isn't just an empty void where you put in a concern or a complaint or or, or comment, but it, it actually does get the reaction and feedback to them. So once you have that respectful space where when I put in a suggestion, I hear back from my leadership, maybe the answer is no, we can't do that right now, but at least they heard it and they listened and they are taking it into consideration. I think that's a, a cultural piece that makes a big difference. When you talk about food, that's a great example because I, I remember learning as a new administrator how a lot of the employees would talk about, you know, we only get a meal ticket, you know, at that time, if we've picked up a shift, we get to eat for free at work. But, you know, we started realizing that was just an important thing period. It was a hassle and a stress for people to plan their bring to work and I can't go out or I can't, and ordering in's expensive. So we just finally committed to why are we why are we making this a, a barrier and put food in that that break room. Every day there was soup and sandwich stuff every day. And if you think about yes, you've got to build that into your budget and feeding your your employees while they're at work uh with uh, something consistent, something that's healthy. Um, yes, you got to build in the budget, but what is the what is the downfall? What is the cost of not doing it? And can does that first resonate? Is it going to be used? And in our case, it was. It was a huge success. It was used by all the staff. They loved it, and it just took that little bit of extra stress for them out of their day with whether it was a cost thing or just the meal planning thing for them to think, I got to figure out what I'm doing for lunch today, or I've got to buy a meal ticket. Now it was just done. And it was one less thing to think about. So there, you know, innovation and creativity doesn't always come in a new gadget and technology, right? It comes in uh, processes or, or little side benefits you can bring. And I think uh, some of that's been brought up, but I, I think, uh, stepping aside and asking your team truly, what are the pain points? And learn from your your leaders and the frontline employees. What are the pain points? What are the hard parts at work? What are the hard parts getting to work? And think about a little out of the box. How can we contribute to making that better? And again, I, it starts with culture in that you have you can have that authentic conversation, but then it, it ends with delivering on those things and really hitting home on the key points. So then they see, okay, they're listening and they care. They care because they they did this because they heard from us. Um, it'll go a long way with uh, building that culture and really retaining people and keeping them happier at work. Oh, good point. Um, I, I wanted to um, also bring up one other thing. You know, daycare is a big, big hurdle for many people. It's like, I, I'm not even getting paid enough to pay for my daycare. And, you know, some of the larger communities, you know, they and some have them and some talk about, you know, incorporating a daycare because it's a great thing for their residents as well, but it would be a great thing for their staff. And I think for recruitment as well, but I know it's a, it's an, it, it's definitely an iffy thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was, and I, and I see this um, a lot where communities um, do, um, com they do, um, oh gosh, I'm going brain dead. We have to cut this part out. <laughs> um, they do uh, educational programs to recruit in other staff. They've been doing it for years and years and years and years and years. What I hear from a lot of the staff within the communities is why don't they do stuff for us? Because they don't always feel included mm -hmm. in that. They feel it's more reaching out to, to others. Um, and I've, I've always found that a really interesting aspect in terms of, of how things are perceived and who is this really for? 
um, and and why it's beneficial uh, to to be able to do that. The and the other thing that I see is many communities doing um, you know individual um, educational programs where they could really do regional and they could do more things on Zoom. They could cut budgets back. In terms of that, still have I think a lot of good effect. I mean, some things you want hands on, but a lot of stuff can be done like this to really cut budgets um, significantly to be able to be placed somewhere else. Um, or the other piece that I hear from people is the trinkets that a lot of companies still buy, the coffee cups, the pens, the notepads, and people say, I, I really don't need this, you know, or even, or even the whole package that they see um, when they're visiting, you know, they're given this folder of all this stuff and they're like, you know, I would actually like to have this emailed to me because then I can share it with my family members, you know, and just maybe having a three ring binder that they share with them. They're giving them the uh, giving people the option to try to cut budgets to be able to, you know, funnel those monies in a different fashion. So those are just uh, some things that I that I have heard. Um, the other thing that I, I really do want to talk about, because I think that this is a, a huge issue, and Lance, you had mentioned yes. about this being people coming in, you know, preconceived of what the environment's going to be like. Um, but that toxic employee, I, I, most people expect there to be at least one in your company that they are going to have to battle as soon as they walk in the door. I mean, I hear that over and over and over. And I hear, why don't they get rid of this person? Because they're driving other good people out. What do you guys think? Is that a correct perception? Um, and if so, why is it so difficult to get rid of that toxic employee? Is it just because everyone's worried they're gonna get sued? Because they, they really, I think, can can take a team and destroy it really quickly. And even and that reputation of, of holding on to a toxic employee is heard because people chatter with that. And, you know, the tolerance of that. And again, I know our world has changed and our, the toxicity level is just raised and that's becoming more and more normal. Um, but I think that has a great impact in terms of who you draw in, who you keep and how you serve as a whole because residents see it too, not just the staff. So anybody would dare to comment on that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment. Uh, I, I think anyone who's operated has that, everything you just said uh, hits home because you've been there and it is a challenge. And I think often um, a reluctancy to address it or move on it, you could you could pick from a list of reasons why any leader doesn't do it. It could be they don't seem like the most important priority at the moment because of some other crisis, right? Or or what have you. Um, but also it's a fear of replacing them because sometimes that toxic employee, uh, though is doing, it's eroding your culture at the end of the day. They, they, they need to be out of your system in order for you to really achieve your goals. But they're sitting on a ton of institutional knowledge or they're in a critical position that you're fearful of, I, am I going to be re able to replace them? And those kind of um, paralyzing thoughts are, are, though, feel like they are justifying your your reasoning. It's not, uh, and, and and everyone knows that. But that can be the barriers, right? And the reality is, you do need to address it, and you need to make those hard decisions, uh, even if it is working through a path to. Uh, that takes longer than you want. Uh, um, but addressing those behaviors, because it, as I said, it erodes culture. It sends the message that this kind of thing is going to be tolerated uh, if you've been here long enough or if you, what have you. Um, and, and you really need to move on making those those changes. Um, the other thing uh, with, I always think of a coaching with relationships at work is sometimes I would have an employee come to me making a complaint about a coworker and how they're making work so difficult or what have you. And if you were to take everything that's being reported to you as absolute gospel, uh, you, you might make a poor decision because you have to separate what's, what's annoying to someone at work. What's kind of 
annoying to be around and what's an actual performance issue and what's actually impacting work and what's just a a personality clash and that kind of like supportive coaching and, and uh, organizational development and team building is an important part of recognizing that. And that's something I would say to a lot of my directors, okay, is this, is this employees productive? Are they doing their work? And these things that are causing a rift or causing departmental issues are these just personality clashes? Doesn't mean it's not important, but it's different because they're, you know, if they're not hurting residents, if they're not really, uh, you know, impacting workflow, they're just a personality clash. Let's work on that. Let's work on how we build boundaries and build a space where they feel safe at work, but you also feel good at work and your team feels good at work. Um, if it's actually impacting work and, and workflows and, and slowing things down or, or distracting from good work or has potential risk of safety, those are bigger performance issues and need to be addressed as such. So sometimes I feel like those things are important distinctions in order to make good decisions about, is this a, this person needs to go, they're not a good fit, they're toxic, truly, or is this a personality class that just needs good coaching and good team building in order to be productive for, for everyone involved? Well, I agree. And I I like the coaching aspect. I think that that's really, really important because a lot of times it can be a communication issue. Um, Again, what I hear frequently is it's more than one person feeling this person is toxic, but they're not talking because it's not safe. And and the perception is they are protected by management. So it's not that open door policy just slam shut. And, And to me, that is that is the critical key when people don't feel safe in their job, but they need their job. And so the even when you're looking at performance, I think it can be if you're not if you're not really open to looking at the the overall realm and really talking to the team and getting to know your peeps, um, it can look like that person is outperforming. And a lot of times it's because they've clamped down on these others that they're not doing their job to the level they used to. One, because they don't have the buy-in and two, because they're scared to death. Um, and and you get that rumor mill that's going and that that whole undercurrent and stuff. So I, I just think, uh, again, I, I hear that a lot from people and I, I think they get dissatisfaction um, in having that person continue because they don't feel valued as an employee. And I think a lot of what we're talking about is how do we get, how do we attract people and make sure that they feel valued and, you know, still get that performance and stuff um, out of them. Um, Deb, you had made a comment about an open source program. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's a way for us to get feedback directly from employees. So we have an open sourcing email and then we have an open sourcing evaluation team. So employees send in their ideas about what they think would help to improve the company or improve the care of our residents. And then the team evaluates those. Um, they really, really try to implement as many as they possibly can. And the winner each month gets a $100 gift card. And then we brag about that in the newsletter. So other employees see hey, I can make an impact uh, and there's a prize for doing so. Um, and it's actually kind of fun. So it's a great way to to get feedback. And we don't know who the team is. I don't know. Um, but it just feels good to know there's people that are reviewing my ideas. Well, that's cool. And, I, you know, I know I might come off like a Debbie Downer with some of the negative things, but I, I fully believe that we have to look at those things, but we also have to acknowledge all the cool stuff. And and that's a that was going to be my next thing is how do you acknowledge employees? You know, is it is it a public acknowledgement? Is it a private one? You know, is it some kind of gift or incentive? Um, Ron, how do you how do you acknowledge people? Well, I think, and just a comment from your prior question is when I walked into the door of this community to, to interview, it was a good feeling to me. So that's the same thing when an employee first walks into your, or to apply or for an interview, it's got to be a good feeling to them or it goes downhill like 
just like when you get a new move in, if something happens wrong in the first day, <laughs> it just goes all downhill. Um, I, I personally, and everybody has like the employee of the month or whatever. I, I just feel like sometimes just going up to somebody and saying, thank you. I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you. Thank you for doing that. Or, you know, having the family member write a little thing to say, you know, they acknowledged you. I think even more so than a gift or whatever, people like to be noticed when they do a good job. We all do, right? So, and, you know, that's something we're working on. There's no such thing as a perfect community. You know, that one toxic person, I, I'm, I'm usually the one who says, brings them in and says, listen, she goes, I didn't say anything. I said, but your face was loud. So, you know, how do you, you know, going back to emotional intelligence, people can read emotions, you know, even if you have Alzheimer's, you can read emotions and you can feel people's emotions. I try to turn over the majority turn around their attitude as much as I can. But at some point, there's going to be a point where, you know, it, it's just not a good fit. Yes, we work with you. We work with you. You know, we try to change that. You can't really change personality. And it may be because they have terrible things in their life going on. But I just think words of encouragement and a thank you and acknowledging what people have done well goes a very, very, very long way. I agree. I, I remember when I was a supervisor, I, I had to have uh, conversations with staff and I kind of did the coaching thing that Joel was talking about. And I needed to let somebody go and um, was one of those. It just wasn't a fit. You, you tried and you tried. And, you know, I learned early on that I can't put more effort into someone's life than they <laughs> You know, and so I, you know, I kind of started with that and, and, you know, talked about, you know, we would love for this to work out, but we can see you're not happy, you know, and the only way you're going to get happy, because we've tried a lot of things is probably to leave. And so, you know, we don't really want to lose you as an employee, you know, we would love to be able to make this work, but we haven't been able to make this happen. And when I explained it in that mode and then help them try to figure out what is it they're looking for in a job, um, I had, you know, employees come back and say, thank you. I, I didn't really know what I was looking for. I didn't really know what I was good at, you know, and I could tell them the things that they were good at and help them kind of analyze those things. And, um, you know, it's always an awkward conversation, needless to say, you know, if you, if you're saying goodbye, but if you can do it, hopefully in a dignified, helpful fashion for them. Um, I think that's uh, that helps. Um, Joel, you had your hand raised earlier. Yeah, just talking about recognition programs or ways to recognize uh, employees. I think in general, recognition programs can be a challenge because uh, if you have that incentive hanging out there, um, I'm an eternal optimist. I always look at the positive. And yet I think we've all seen situations where so and so got the the prize or the the gift or the money and there's going to be someone feeling left out or feeling like they shouldn't have deserved it and so there can be this other side of that that is unfortunate because the idea is to make people feel good and, and encouraged and so i think you can have both i think there's a place for both it's just you have to be really sensitive to knowing your people, which, you know, has been talked about consistently by both Dev and Ron in knowing your employees and what really impacts them. Something I had success with was, you know, to Ron's comments, my director of nursing, you know, that, that relationship obviously is incredibly sacred and important when you're leading a community. And I'd always work closely with the director of nursing and all directors to say, when we have one-on-one -on -one conversations or we're having our scheduled time to, to catch up on things, I want to know who on the team needs an extra bump of encouragement, who is really stepping up for you that I might not know about, what stories have I missed that I should know about, because if I can go out on the floor during my rounds and pull that person aside and say, hey, I heard about this, or I so-and-so uh, was talking about you yesterday, think about that secondhand compliment that comes from a, a third party, so to, so to speak, there's something very special about hearing, you know, we all know our our, our parents are going to say you have a great singing voice or you're the best 
baseball player or whatever. But when the stranger says, your mom was talking about you, it feels different than when mom said that to you directly, right? And so it, it, it works at work too. And, and I felt like if I, when, when a third party goes up and says, I heard um, you have really stepped up on this field and they have something specific to share about what they did, that you talk about a day brightener, it's, it goes a long way because they know not only did the director of nursing say, thank you, they were so impressed. They told others about me and that person wanted to let me know. And so I think that builds another culture of, boy, they aren't just lip service or putting up a, a front of, I think you're great. They mean it from the heart and they're talking about it. And so we would always make a point to say, let's, let's talk about those things. And, and it, it's an, it's, leadership development is a part of this because leaders who, you know, and that's exactly what I'm hearing from both, both of you today, uh, in, in that you see that you practice it, but leadership development and having people who come authentically to their teams is as important as recruiting. If you want to have a strong culture, uh, and you're recruiting people in, but then they land with a, a leader who, uh, isn't driving home that culture that you you want, uh, it's going to be for not, you're going to start over. And so it's those two things are, are going to go hand in hand. Interesting. Thank you. Um, one last comment I'm going to make is, uh, and this has to do with staff training was over in the UK, there's one company that does training really different and they do a vulnerability training and their vulnerability training has nothing to do with their job. It's getting the group together and authentically saying what's going on in their life. So if they've got a sick parent, if they're struggling in a relationship, finances, whatever, but they they do this training and get this openness. And they said it's really awkward in the beginning, but it builds their team so much stronger because everybody knows what's going on when they leave the door and everyone can support. Because somebody here had said, you know, you, you don't, you know, it's impossible to leave your life at home and come into work. And now people can support you through that. And um, it was it was incredible. Um, they said the results that they've had and even the residents then kind of know what's going on and are supporting people. And they really build this sense of of community. And I thought that was um, extremely interesting as well. And I know with privacy and stuff over here, we've got different rules at my Right? Not always, always work, but I just found that really interesting. Lance, you've been really quiet. I know I'm listening you, to all the information. I know you must have some comments here. No, I, I, I really think it comes down to who's the one behind the name. So what I mean by that is, you know, the mentality, the values and the principles of the company, of the management, and it trickles down from there. You know, the staff are going to feed off of that. I, I love what, uh, you know, Ron is saying about, you know, with, you know, he's kind of taking over the, was it cultural side, I think, and his nurse was going to handle the clinical side, whatnot. Um, and I think that just spreads, right? I mean, the, the staff, they're coming in, like Ron had said, they want to do a good job. They want to help people. For the most part, that's hopefully the mentality of everybody and kind of their motivation for working in healthcare and senior care. But when they see and they see how the tone has been set, they then follow that lead, right? If you go in and, you know, comp the company management doesn't care if you show up 20 minutes late or, you know, you take an extra half an hour on your break or what have you, that's going to spread to everybody. Then you're going to just have chaos and everybody's going to just follow whatever suit's been led with. So I think it really boils down to what the values, principles, and, uh, you know, uh, expectations are that the company and management is setting forth for the staff to follow. And it's really that easy, I think, but it's finding the right people who will buy into that as well. Yeah. I, I think of a, a family when they get a phone call from a residence, their heart just starts beating, you know, it's like, what's wrong now? Yeah. Because that's really, they, they think the only time they get that call, you know, and again, I know some communities have changed that, but it's like, are they in the hospital? Did they fall? Is something stolen? Are they missing? I mean, it's all those red flag issues. And I think um, when it comes to management, we also have to be aware that sometimes staff have that kind of white coat syndrome 
towards management too. What I do? <laughs> Why do they want to talk to me? And to be able to even that out and maybe just sit down and say, you know, you want to have lunch with me and not even talk about work, right. but to get to know them as a human being and take that, you know, take that fear away and um, show the interest and and things. So this has just been, I, I think, a, just an amazing conversation. I know I have learned a lot. I'm wondering if there is, you know, one or two things that that each of you have learned from the others um, or as a takeaway that you might want to, you know, apply or look deeper into. Um, Joel, I'm going to go to you first. I think the thing that sticks with me, and and I heard versions of this from both Deb and Ron today, is about flexible uh, workplace in a way that works in healthcare. Because I think oftentimes flexible workplace in, in the broader community sounds like, oh, you got remote workers and, you know, you can allow that. And we all know in healthcare, you, you need nurses and caregivers to show up. And so that isn't an option for a lot of positions. But when, you, when you're uh, operating with 12 hour shifts work for us, or we're recruiting people who want to work in these spaces, like Deb talked about in the evenings or night shifts or weekends where it's, it can be hard otherwise. That's, that's also a version of that that finds flexibility. Because if I'm a college student and uh, now I have an employer that is willing to work with me because they need me on those weekends that I'm available, uh, it starts to click. And so that's creative thinking in a different way and getting beyond that. We have these blocks and everybody has to do these blocks a certain way and everyone works exactly the same number of weekends. And it has to be that way that so much of the industry has operated for many, many years. That's the flexibility that on this you know conversation that I've heard where there are ways that the, the industry can evolve and continue to be flexible to the workforce and in the setting, and it doesn't mean people are coming and going willy nilly. It just means it fits their lifestyle. And that's, I think, a big takeaway from today of they both have great examples of what's working for their communities. And it starts by knowing your people. And that's that's important, and knowing who, you're, who, who is serving with you and your communities so then you can meet them there. And I thought that was uh, those are some great examples. So I appreciated learning about that. Thank you. Deb, anything, any takeaways that you have from this conversation? So many. I've been taking notes like crazy. I can't wait to install bidets in all of our homes. <laughs> That's a fantastic idea. But even more like technology, 12-hour shifts, um, having incentive pay available same day, That that's really going to be something that I want to look into and bring back to my team. I, I did want to share one other flexibility thing that has helped us immensely is we created um, a full-time weekend only position. And so if our staff work 32 hours just on the weekends, it would be two double eight hour shifts. So um, starting Friday evening and the awakes through Sunday evening, they can get full-time benefits for 32 to 36 hours. It's virtually eliminated the need for us to pay incentives. And so the balance, the offset has, has really been useful. As a matter of fact, we don't have places to put people now that want those hours. So it helped us out in what, what for us had become uh, a very difficult thing to fill weekends, especially if it's on a holiday or uh a school break or zombie pub crawl. Do you know about that? It's a thing. I, it's not my world, but anyway, so thank you guys for all the ideas. Great. Thanks. Thank Deb. you. Deb. How about you? I, well, I took a lot of notes too. I have to comment on the Boudet. Awesome idea. Boudet. How do you pronounce that? I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Deb gave great examples on how to retain staff and incentives and trying to get uh, you know, the culture changed, which I love trying to do is getting culture changed. I want to look up, uh, Lori, the uh, vulnerability training, because when a staff member asks me, like more information, or how can I grow, I always tell them to read emotional intelligence, even though it doesn't have anything to do with their specific tasks, but it has everything to do with life, right? So, 
Um, I just learned a lot and I hope to carry these through um, to my, my new home here because culture really guides everything from customer satisfaction to what the residents deserve, right? So that's, that's, that's awesome. So thank you all for allowing me to voice. Thank you. Lance, you want to wrap us up or toss in what you've learned today? Yeah, I just uh, first want to thank all three of you for, you know, sharing your time, your insights and expertise with us and our audience. Um, but I would just kind of piggyback on what I'd said previously, Lori. It's, it really is the culture and setting the tone from the get-go so that you get the buy-in and you also get the trust and confidence of the staff because without that, there will be no loyalty and there will be no commitment to the job or to the company. Okay, wonderful. Well, we will have resources. If you guys think of any resource links that you want us to add, um, please send those to me because I'll add those into the show notes. We've got a couple, but um, you know, I just think this has been a really interesting co uh, conversation and I hope it gets people thinking out of the box in terms of how to approach, you know, uh, this problem has been going on for years. It just amplified over COVID and we're still readjusting and so is our world. Um, and the wants and needs of, of everybody. So uh, I, I love the creativity that people are approaching this with. I, I, you know, I love the, uh, the technology wrapped in the relationship-based um, building of community and uh, building respect for one another. So thank you. Thank you for joining us here at Conscious Caregiving with LNL, where we're tackling the tough conversations. We look forward to seeing you again here next month. Thank you.